Jean-François Cloutier. I work for Starlet uh, Software. Um, I live in Portland, Maine. You're all invited to come to Maine, by the way. All right. So let's see. Oh, already. Here we go. So as Eric mentioned, when we uh, talk about DDD, it's usually in the context of uh, business applications. Well, not this morning. We'll have a little bit of DDD variety. Uh, we're going to be talking about DDD, robots, and AI. Now, I, I want to share with you how I got to programming uh, Lego robots. Um, and there's a little bit of an urgent story here. Uh, and to explain to you how and why, I have to go way, way back. So I was born in 1959, pretty much the same year that uh, John McCarthy invented uh, Lisp. Uh, John McCarthy is the, one of the found, uh, fathers of artificial intelligence. Now, uh, fast forwarding, if I may. Come on, guys. I'm going to switch to something else. Okay. Let's see. Fast forwarding here to. Come on. Can we move to the PowerPoint? Can we move to the PowerPoint? Thank you. Oops, how do I go right? How do I go forward with this guy? I'm sorry? Ah, there you go, thank you. So, uh, fast forwarding to uh, 1980. Uh, 80s, I'm doing a, a computer science degree and with a concentration in artificial intelligence. And I'm, I'm exposed to uh, a book called The Society of Mind by Marvin Minsky. Uh, which I found very striking. It tries to uh, explain uh, intelligent, the mind, as a, an emergence from many simple agents interacting concurrently in simple ways. I don't remember much else from that book, but I, that, that struck me as uh, rather interesting. After that, I you know, went to work. I worked for a prologue company. I did uh, Quite a bit of small talk, uh, commercial projects, commercial products were uh, I, I wrote in small talk. Then long years of uh, Java, lots and lots and lots of Java. But in 2013, I came across Erlang. I don't remember exactly how I did that, but how that happened. But I, I, I read about Erlang. I found out about Erlang. Erlang is a uh, concurrent-oriented language. It's a language that was developed by Ericsson in, uh, in Scandinavia uh, to program their switches. And the problems they had uh, is that they needed to write programs that would be fault tolerant, that would uh, run on multiple switches, that would stay on all the time through software upgrades. And in order to meet these difficult requirements, they uh, unwittingly reinvented the actor model um, and they, um, they created a, a runtime system called the Beam. It's a virtual machine that enabled uh, a, this, this concurrency-oriented programming that uh, gave them the fault tolerance they were looking for. So I, I, I learned about Erlang, and I, and I, I latched on and said, this, this is really the future of, of programming, especially with the advent of multi-core systems, where you need to do a lot of parallelism in order to get all the, the, the juice out of your uh, computers. Then I, I found out about Elixir, which is a, um, uh, a, a dialect of Erlang. Uh, expats from the Ruby community said, uh, we, we love this environment. We love the, the capabilities of the runtime environment. We don't so much like 
the way the language looks. We don't so much like uh, the quality of the, 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 the tool set. Uh, we're going to try to bring the best from the Ruby um, world mentality into the Erlang world, and so uh, was born uh, Elixir. And since uh, 2013, I've been uh, working uh, professionally pretty much exclusively in Erlang and uh, Elixir. Now, I'm, I'm uh, going to give you just a very, you know, one slide dip into uh, Erlang Elixir so that uh, that informs the rest of the talk. This is not a language presentation. Uh, Erlang is an Elixir uh, are functional languages. So everything is functional. The uh, data is immutable. Um, but everything is a process. Everything runs in a process. These, these are very lightweight processes. You can have millions of these processes running on the beam. They take a, a, a K or, or, or so of, 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 data, of space, of memory. They communicate exclusively through messages. The messages are share nothing messages. So there's no way one process going down will corrupt another process. They share nothing. Um, the beam, which is the, uh, the runtime environment, does preemptive scheduling. So there's absolutely no risk of one process hogging the CPU. Um, and the, the, the processes are scheduled on all cores, and dynamically the work is allocated on all cores. So your, your machine can really hum. You can, you can see all cores busy, 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 and, and you don't have a core that's just sitting idle and waiting for something to do. So that's, that's very uh, efficient. The processes, and that's important, can be connected. So uh, processes can be linked. Two processes can be linked, for example, and they can be linked in a, a death pact. So if one dies, the other one dies. Or they can be linked in a, in a monitoring relationship where um, uh, if one process, the process being monitored, uh, dies, uh, the process that monitors it gets a message, says, ah, mm, so and so uh, had an early uh, death. And then the process can do something about it. Now, based on these capabilities, you have a framework on top of that that's called OTP that implements uh, supervi supervisors and workers, supervisory trees that allow supervisors to manage a bunch of workers, and if a worker dies, to restart it in a, in a known proper state. And then there are different restart strategies in there. So that uh, model is the one that you find in ACA. Uh, under Scala, and it's in different environments as well, but that, it originated here. Um, so all these make for a very powerful uh, programming environment. Um, so all in all, what we have here is Erlang and Elixir implement a fault-tolerant actor model that's programmable with, with functions. That's pretty much what you need to know. Now, I got so excited about uh, Elixir that I started a, um, uh, a meetup in Portland. And here's a, uh, one of our meetups, and you can see that one of our meetup members is, is Eric. He came in at, at a meetup and gave us an intro to uh, a DDD, and uh, then we, it was followed by a discussion on how DDD maps into uh, the uh, Elixir Erlang world. Uh, and as I was you know, running this meetup, I, I was kind of wanting to do something exciting, something fun. I was looking for an interesting topic, something to talk about beyond just language and, and, and syntax and, and, and whatnot. Around that time, I found on, on, uh, on YouTube this, uh, this presentation that uh, Torben Hoffman did at an Erlang user conference about how you can program Lego robots in Lexer. And a Lego robot, really, it's, it's, it's just, the core of it is a, this Lego brick, this computer with ports. And this brick is reasonably powerful. And it's, a, it's a single core, 300 megahertz, nothing you know, to, to mess your hair. And it has 64 uh, megs of RAM, which is sufficient to run something quite uh, good. And you have ports for sensors, and you have ports for motors. Now, the built-in programming environment that comes with the uh, Mindstorm EV3, by the way, it's the world's greatest toy. If you don't have one, go get one, is, is a visual programming language which encourages big, huge control loops. I'm not into big, huge control loops. That's from an Elixir background and multiple processes and all that stuff. I don't like the idea. Luckily, and that's what was uh, uh, 
I found out from that talk by Torben Hoffman, there's such a thing called EV3Dev. EV3Dev is an open source project. It's a distribution of, of uh, uh, Linux, Debian uh, Linux, that adds a number of drivers so that you can run, by the way, you can yeah, you have a, a micro SD card port on the, the EV3 brick, that's really important, and you can boot an alternate Linux. You can boot something else. And if you can boot EV3 dev, then you have, you have these drivers that when you plug in port, uh, uh, sensors and, and actuators into ports, they are reflected into the file system to which you can read, from which you can read and to which you can write. And you can do that in any programming language whatsoever obviously, any programming language that runs on Linux. So you can even uh, interact with sensors and, and actuators directly from the console by uh, reading, uh, going to the file system to the, where the, a certain sensor is, reading files that say, okay, what is the uh, current uh, setting of that sensor? What is the current port of that sensor? And then you can write and say, okay, uh, I want you to, uh, for a color sensor, I want you now to, to uh, be a uh, brightness sensor. And then you can read from a, a value file what's the current brightness. Beautiful, simple. Motors, the same thing. You can, you can look at the various motors that I plugged in into the file system. You can... Uh, uh, set their, 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 uh, the torque of the motor, the direction of the motor, the polarity. You can then uh, write a command and say, oh, you're, you're going to run for five seconds, and then you can say, go, run. So everything through read, write operations. Now, I looked at that and said, okay, great. So I can, pro I, I, I can run Elixir on a Lego robot, thanks to AV3 Dev. And then I remembered society of mind. Oh, I can implement a society of mind on a Lego robot. That would be the cool project I was looking for for the next series of meetups. So I ordered, obviously, uh, immediately, and, and thanks to our friends at uh, Amazon, it came in the next day. And um, uh, it was immediately inspected by my intern and considered satisfactory, and my intern would end up being my chief robot builder as well. So it's a lovely, lovely set of, uh, of, of sensors and motors and, and various uh, uh, structural pieces. So during the course of 2016, I, uh, I implemented this society of mind on a Lego robot, and we'll go into more details later. And, um, it led to a bunch of, of, of meetups, uh, a series of four meetups. Uh, each one, uh, I, would, I would add and add and add more capabilities to, uh, to uh, my robot. In uh, 2016 and 2017, uh, we, we got a, a little grant from uh, uh, Maine to generalize this to uh, what we call the communities of smart things. Instead of so I generalized the robot to a smart thing, a smart device, any, any device that has sensors and actuators and or actuators. Um, and, and then I, could, uh, I, I extended the framework so that we could create communities of such devices so that they could talk to each other, uh, sense each other, in addition to sensing their environment, collaborate together, and not only that, but they could form multiple communities and the communities could talk to each other. So you could have a, a, a local community and a regional community that would then look at what the local, uh, you could think of the local community almost like a sensor for, the, for another community. And the, the higher level community would then make decisions, do things, and maybe call back the lower uh, level, the more local community, and say, I want you to, I want you to do this. I want, this, is, this is what's happening globally. So now you react locally. And, and this begins to give us a framework for implementing the more complex um, Internet of Things uh, applications, which are, in essence, systems of systems, like smart cities, smart grids, and whatnot. Anyway, so that was, that's what happened. So now, uh, a demo. Now that's going to be interesting. So now I have to go back to this, if I can. Can you go back to my, uh, my screen? So let's see if I can go forward on this guy. No. I'm going to 
try to get there. Because you've got to see the demo. Not sure. Let's see if I can present this. Yes. And yes. So in this demo, we have two robots, Marv and Rodney. And there's, they have formed their community, puppies. And then there's a, a parent community with mom that looks over them. And they're, they're going to do all sorts of things. They're going to bump into walls. They're going to avoid collisions. They're going to look for food. Food is the paper on the floor. And the scent of food is a beacon that's in front of the, the paper. And, they, and when one finds the food, the other one's going to get greedy, wants to steal it from him, and, and then when one starts panicking because it collides in, in the dark, the panic is going to spread, all these things. So let's see if we can get this to run. And let's watch this. Let's check things out. So they, they're curious, they're going to roam. It's not easy being a mom. It's not easy being a mom, so mom complains. So now that one is hungry, they're looking for food. So they... Oh, it bumps. Uh-oh, finds out it's stuck, gets unstuck. Uh-oh, again. So the one on the right kind of figured out the food was over there, but kind of went too far, so now it can't see the beacon. But the, the one closer by, Let's say it's Marv, ah, sees the food, so it starts zo zooming in on the food. Detects the food on the ground, nom da nom da nom, starts eating. While poor Rodney is trying to extricate itself from the corner. And getting stuck, oh ho. Nom da nom da nom. Now, mom thinks that's not fair. Oh, now it detected the other one's eating. It's mine. I want it. But it's using, it's all in the food. It's mine. It's mine. I want it. I want it. Still eating. Share your food with Marv. Now, mom sees that one is hugging the food, so tells Marv, share your food. And Marv would say, fine, I'm going to stop eating move away from the food, because now the hunger is gone, start exploring, but now it's going to bump in a dark corner, starts getting scared, and share the fear, the panic will spread, and they're all panicking, so mom says, calm down, little Marv, because she detected the panic, and they calm down, and now they're hungry again, and they're going to look uh, for food. So let's go back to the PowerPoint. So now, let's see how this was done from a DDD perspective. So we're going to wear our DDD glasses and look at how I designed the mind of this robot. Well, the domain is consciousness. That's the domain. It's not, you know, shipping. It's not hotel management. It's consciousness. And um, you can look at consciousness as uh, four layers. That's one of many ways of looking at consciousness. The bottom layer being sensory experiences, you know, your senses, your perception of the world around you. A higher la layer would be practical experience. This is knowing how to do things. What are your goals? Do you know how to accomplish them? A higher level still would be reflective experience. What do you want to do? What's your motives? What do you know about the immediate past so that you have a, a context to, to understand uh, what happened recently that may um, kind of uh, mediate what you want to do now. And the highest level is reflexive experience, which is self-knowledge. How do I know what I know? Who am I? And all. That's obviously out of scope for me right now. <laughs> and the system metaphor, because we th think about system metaphors when we, when we talk about DDD, uh, here clearly is the society of mind. And if you've seen the movie P uh, Inside Out by Pixar, it is a cartoonish interpretation of the society of mind. I was kind of thrilled when I saw that movie coming out. Now, we have obviously two bounded contexts to start with. We have the EV3 dev world, which sees everything as files that you read from and write to. Files that are essentially global variables. 
if you think of it this way. And then there's the mind, the consciousness. This is where my design lies. And these are two bounded contexts. And clearly, one of the first thing I did, and I didn't think of it as is as it at the time, but the first, my first phase, if you want, of this project was to develop an anti-corruption layer so that I could have a, a, a mind in terms of agents, you know, uh, multiple agents doing simple things in, in simple ways, interacting and all that, and uh, very functional in, in, in its implementation. Interact, of course, you have to interact with the, the actual EV3 uh, dev uh, world so that you can issue commands and, and, and read sensors uh, values. So I created an entire corruption layer. And the entire corruption layer, you can see, it allows me to be in, on, on the side of, 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 of the mind um, to have uh, immutable devices. A device is either a sensor or a, an actuator. And um, I can ask, for example, um, what are the connected devices right now? I've got a bunch of devices. And for each device, I can, uh, uh, through a function, alter its, its, uh, its, its mode. So that I want the... Uh, color detector to become a brightness detector. Now, I get a new device out of this. This is transformation through functions. And then I can ask my device, now I want you to um, read the brightness. And I get a new device out of it, maybe the same device, maybe a new device. And all this is happening through communications with AV3 dev, and it goes through this anti-corruption layer, so I'd never have to think in my world, in my bounded context, as my robot, as a bunch of global variables. I don't. So, as, as Eric mentioned, I developed a ubiquitous language for the mind of what I call smart things. You know, my robot is a smart thing. And there's a, a bunch of, of concepts. There's a sense, what you perceive at the lowest level, what you detect, let's put it this way, what you detect, brightness, distance, and whatnot. And I have the notion of a uh, concept of devices, a device would be a sensor, a motor, could be the sound system on the, on the, the, the EV3, could be the LEDs on the EV3. I have the concept of a, of a smart thing, which is a device with a consciousness. I have the notion of a community, which is a bunch of smart things that can connect and, and see each other, perceive each other. Then I have the, the, the key, we'll see later, they are value objects. They have a percept. What am I perceiving? I'm perceiving distance, I'm perceiving darkness, I'm perceiving uh, danger, I'm perceiving hunger, um, motives. What do I feel? I feel curious, I feel hungry, I feel greedy. All these motives that, that drive my behaviors, and my behaviors generate a bunch of intents. I want to move forward, I want to move backwards, I want to say something. So, these are important parts of the ubiquitous language. And then we have all these smart agents, these little agents that do all these simple things. I have detectors, perceptors, motivator, behavior, actuator, attention, central nervous system, and memory. Now we're going to see how they all come together. Let's look into the mind of a smart thing. First, at the lowest level, we have, we have detectors. And detectors, basically, they pull sensors. And by the way, a motor is also a sensor because it, 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 it can ask at what speed are you going right now, you know? Are you straining? What not? So I have a bunch of detectors and uh, their job is to pull. Uh, by the way, internal clock is also a detector. It detects the passage of time and it's a critical element of the mind. Take it away, nothing works. Then we have perceptors. Oh, before I go forward. Um, Detectors generate percepts, and when they generate percepts, they, s they communicate them to the central nervous system. Central nervous system connects all these agents together. Agents do not know of each other in general. So percepts are generated by detectors. Perceptors consume percepts, and they interpret these, these percepts in the context of the recent paths. And the recent past is held in the memory, which the central nervous system feeds with the current percepts, motives, and intents that have been generated in the system. And you have a perceptor, for example, that will say, ha, I can see the brightness is 30%, but based on previous past, it's getting darker. So I have a darker, brighter perceptor. And maybe I have a perceptor that says, 
if it's getting darker and in the past, in recent past, I've bumped into something, I'm perceiving danger. So you have kind of a hierarchy of perceptors with higher and higher levels of perceptions. And when a percept is generated, it's sent to the nervous system and it's distributed everywhere it needs to be. One of the places it needs to be is motivator. A motivator. You have multiple motivators. I have one for, let's say, we'll have one for hunger and, and one for fear and one for curiosity. And based on the percepts that are flowing in into the mo these motivators, they may turn on or off hunger, fear, and whatnot. And as those motives are turned on and on, they're, of course, communicated to the central nervous system, stored in memory, but they're consumed by behaviors. Because those motives become like goals. I'm hungry, thus I look for food. I'm afraid, thus I panic like a headless chicken. So those behaviors are turned on and off by um, these motives, and they, are, they progress based on percepts that flow in. If I'm looking for food, where am I going to go? I'm going to go where it smells like the food is closer. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rely on scent percepts to direct my behavior. And then when I, I behave, I generate intents. I want to turn this way, because it smells like the food is this way, and I want to move forward. Those are intents, but these are realized. It can be realized differently on different kinds of robots. If you have a one-wheel robot, like uh, 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 you know, the robots in, in, in Star Wars, where it's a ball rolling, going forward is very different from a, a going forward a, by a robot that has two wheels. Turning is different, but the intent might be the same. So I have actuators that translate those intents into actual commands to the motors based on the physical configuration of my uh, smart thing. And then there's something that was added quite recently, is the notion of attention. Now, I could pull all the detectors all the time. Now, remember, this is a, not an extremely powerful little computer. Uh, things can get, it can get overwhelmed, and it does get overwhelmed. And I have a strategy for dealing with that, just called fainting, which I won't get into. But what the attention does, it says at any moment in time, knowing what behaviors are active and, and knowing what... Uh, what uh, motivators are, motives are on or off, I will pull certain detectors, but not other. It's my attention. I ignore certain things, and I pay attention to others. So all these things together, they're all working at the same time. They're all firing at the same time. These are all agents. All, each one of these boxes is an agent. They're always on. They're always alive. They're always firing. So you can have a, a kind of a storm of, 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 of events flowing through. Let's look at, we looked at perception in, in, in some, uh, a little bit when we talked about how we could go from uh, light to, to danger. And this is a little bit more detailed. So a detector will uh, produce a percept sent to the central nervous system. The central nervous system is an event manager, and it has various handlers that, that know which perceptors are interested in this particular percept, sends the percept to the perceptor, the perceptor analyzes it, may or may not produce a new percept, which is then communicated back to the central nervous system and stored in memory. Pretty straightforward. Again, simple agents sim doing simple things. That's what you want, but you want lots of them. Motivation, same idea. You will have, for example, a, a, a high-level percept that says, collision imminent. Um, and the motivator would say, oh, I'm interested in that. Um, that's the fear motivator. And it says, yes, but asking memory, uh, is it dark right now? Memory says, yeah, it's dark. <sighs> Turns on the fear motivator. The fear motivator is that motive is the scent to the central nervous system consumed by the fear behavior, which drives the headless chicken behavior of the robot, which you saw. Behaviors, state machines, turned on by motives and then moved forward by uh, various percepts. And in the process of going from state to state, intents are generated which are executed by the actuators. I also have reflexes, which are, don't need to be motivated. If you're about to run into a wall, you avoid it. You don't need to have a goal. You avoid it. So I have reflexes also in this setup. And actuation, as I, as I mentioned, it transforms, uh, interprets an intent into a series of commands. There are little scripts. Turning right means set the right wheel speed to a negative, set the left wheel speed to positive, 
and then run the motors for a certain amount of time, and then you turn. All right. Now imagine all these things are happening at once. These are essentially a bunch of overlapping OODA loops. Observe, orient, decide, and act, if you think about that. This is all happening at once. It's a milestrow of intense percepts, motives being turned on and off, and, and behaviors being activated and whatnot. One thing I, for, I forgot to mention is that motives have a little something that's interesting that's kind of borrowed from Rodney Brooks' uh, architecture, that a motive can turn off another motive. So I'm curious, I'm basically curious, that's, all, that's on, that's always on actually in, in this setup. But if I'm uh, hungry, it will inhibit the curiosity because now forget exploring, where's the food? And if I'm hungry and, 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 and it's on, hunger is on, but then I, I, a fear turns on, forget hunger, I don't feel my hunger anymore, I just want to get out of here. You know, so motives turn on and off. So what are the DDD building blocks here? We have percept, motive, intent, which I've described. They are obviously value objects. They're immutable. They're, they have a state, but they don't have an identity. I don't, don't want to think about, oh, uh, percept number three, four, five, six. It's just the value. And they are uh, the payloads of these domain events that uh, stream out of the central nervous system to the various agents. And these various agents, detector, behavior, memory, and perceptor, et cetera, are either actors or servers. And the distinction is very slight, really. Um, actors, I think of them as entities. I can't use the word entity because actors are alive. They are uh, long-lived processes. They are agents. Agents are long-lived processes, but actors have a state. Like my memory obviously have a, has a state. But detectors have a state because my detectors won't fire if, if, uh, with a percept if it's the same percept that was just fired. So it only not, uh, it notifies basically of a change in the environment. So they are, they are stateful. Servers are those agents that are stateless. Central nervous system is stateless. Well, it has a state, but it doesn't change. It's also the, the pub sub that's set up at the beginning. So, actors and servers and value objects. There's some kind of event sourcing going on in there. Um, the the short-term memory. All the, uh, the, the percepts, intents, motives that are generated are stored in a short-term memory. Um, and and they're, 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 they live for a certain amount of time and then they're, they're forgotten but they're used by the perceptors and motivators and behaviors to, to answer queries. Did I try to move in the last five seconds? Did, 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 did I eat in the last five, you know, 10 seconds? Have I been unafraid for the last 10 seconds? And, and these are queries that uh, are used by perceptors, motivators, and behaviors in order to make decisions. Where do these perceptors, motivators come from? They, uh, they are uh, created by factories, and they're from a definition. So I, ha I will have a, a, a definition of the fear percept, the, 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 the danger perceptor. I'll have a definition of the fear motive. And these definitions are read, if you want, are, are used by the, the, the factory, which happens to be the, the thing's supervisor. So a perceptor has a supervisor, and at the beginning, at, at startup, the perceptor supervisor says, okay, what are all the perceptors that I, are available to me? Read them all, and then generate all the perceptors, and kick them, and now they're alive. And if, should one perceptor crash, no problem. We'll, we'll restart it, we'll recreate it from the Perceptor's, def it's perceptor's definition, so it restarts in a clean state. All right, now where do these perceptor definitions, motive definitions, et cetera, come from? Well, when I said I, I did some work generalizing the early work so that it would apply to any smart thing, not just you know, Lego robots, one of the things that I did is, is I, I added layers to this. I layered up. 
And obviously, we have the EV3 dev layer, which we talked about. We have the anti-corruption layer, great. But now, the domain layers are broken out into system, and that's where we describe this, the, the, the anatomy, the specifics, the construction of the device. Which sensors are plugged in which port? Which motors are plugged in which ports? Then we have the mine layer, which is the, 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 the generic you know, cognition. The, 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 the supervisors and, 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 and all the machinery to, uh, uh, to uh, run and activate the perception, the motivation, and whatnot. But the specifics of which detectors, how they're defined, uh, and actuators, are they are they're defined? Basically, the anatomy, the specific anatomy of my device is in the platform layer. And the psychology of my device is in the profile layer. So what are the, the perceptors? What can it perceive? How does it perceive these things? What motivates it? How does it get motivated? What are the behaviors? And I have two platforms, and you've seen them. We have the rover platform, the little robot scurrying about. And we have the mom platform, which just keeps you know, telling, them, share your food, you know, calm down. And then we have uh, the, the, the profiles, which provide these behaviors to uh, both puppy and, and, and mom. So that gives us a little bit more complex uh, bound, uh, bound context map. Uh, we have, for sure, the mine and the v 3 dev, but now we have, we have these, these platform and, and profile bounded contexts. Um, and we have, in terms of the profiles, we have a puppy profile, and we have a mom profile, and in terms of the platforms, we have a rover and, and hub. So if you combine the puppy profile and the rover plat uh, platform, then we have our little robot with, with its mind. And if you combine mom's profile with the, the, the mom's platform, which happens to be just a laptop, then we have the mom. So the ubiquitous language for the rover uh, a platform is basically what are the sensors that are plugged in, what are the motors that are plugged in, and what are the uh, actuations that are possible on this physical um, body of, of, of the robot. And we have locomotion, which is going forward, backward, turn right, left, stop. We have manipulation, which is eat. So when, when it, it finds food and starts eating, it runs a little motor, rah, 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 and, it, and it says, you know, yum, 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 num, da, num, da, num, which is the sound uh, uh, actuation. And then it has lights that can turn on and off. When it panics, it turns the red lights, et cetera. And it has communication. So it, when it says, hmm, I'm eating, others can hear it and say, aha, I want it too. It's mine. So we have, that's the ubiquitous language of a rover. And that's the rover, now the rover platform. Uh, and the way it's implemented uh, in, um, in Elixir, and again, this is not a, a language tutorial, but I want you to at least see that the ubiquitous language is reflected almost directly in the implementation. So it's very clear, the mapping between langu ubiquitous language and implementation. And here we have the uh, locomotion uh, actuation, uh, actuation configuration, the definition, and we have when you, need to, when you intend to go forward, run the go forward uh, action, which are function, which will give you a function instructing how to go forward, how to go backward. And going backward is a script, as set, the, 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 set the wheel, right wheel to backward, set the, 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 the left wheel to backward, and then run, so you, you're, you're backing up. So we have uh, little uh, scripts for realizing all the different intents for this rover platform. Profile, okay, profile, we have getting stuck, getting into a collision, light, hungry, sand, food is nearby, I'm eating food right now, I, I'm on the food right now, this, this danger uh, abounds, and all these various perceptions. And we have motivation, remember, we have curiosity, hunger, fear, and greed. These are things, these are actual you know, value objects, uh, reflected as value objects. Behavior, we've seen them. That's for the rover. And all they all come together, and we're not going to go through all that, but that all they all come together, you, you can see that we have 
perception, motivation, behavior, and actuation. Actuation is actually more at the, it's at the platform level. And they all interconnect. They all feed into each other. So if we look, for example, at um, uh, getting stuck, it's in the, uh, lower, uh, it's in the left uh, up of perception. Well, it's, you're getting stuck if you know you've tried to move recently, but your, your distance reading stays the same and your distance to the food stays the same. I am not moving. There's evidence I'm not moving, and yet I just tried to, yet, and thus, I am stuck. And if I'm stuck, then it's going to trigger the behavior of getting unstuck and whatnot, and, and other uh, perceptions like that. And you can see uh, uh, motivations, how each one can inhibit another. Greed inhibits hunger. Hunger inhibits curiosity. And fear inhibits uh, curiosity. The perception of the puppy, how it's programmed, again, I want you to see that the mapping between the ubiquitous language and the implementation is quite direct. So in the, in the, 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 the configuration of all the, percepts, the perceptors for the, the puppy uh, profile, we have a bunch, and we have light, we have collision, and we can see uh, for each one, what is the focus? For, for light detection, all I care about is ambient light values. And that way I'm going to find out if it's getting darker or lighter. For, uh, if it, and for a collision, well, I care about a lot of things. Uh, distance, am I getting closer, further? Touch, am I actually colliding? Uh, have I collided in the past? Um, and, and others. And the logic, for example, the logic for um, uh, generating a light uh, a percept about, is it a light percept, uh, which would be it's the same light, it's a darker light, it's a, it's a lighter light, um, is quite simple. Um, I looked in the past, and if the previous reading was lower, it was lighter, it was, it was darker, that means it's getting lighter. So I, I compare with the immediate past. Is, is, am, am I reading an, a, a higher value or a lower value than the most recent one? And then I can produce a, a person that says, oh, it's getting darker. For uh, the panicking behavior, here it's a finite state machine. Again, we, you, you can see a, quite a direct uh, mapping. What do I care about when I'm panicking? First of all, I'm, I'm motivated by fear. My senses are, I care about light and time elapsed. And my initial state is started, final state is ended. And I go from started to, uh, to panicking by doing the doing panicking, which in, in this, uh, and, and which is, means essentially just yelping, I'm afraid. And then as time passes and I'm still in a fear state, I will do the panic dance. And then when I get out of it, then I will do something else like turning off the red light, for example, by calming down. And the panic behavior is quite simple. It, one to four times, I'm going to go backwards quite fast, and then I will either turn right or turn left, and um, that's it. That's the headless chicken behavior. Very simple. So all these definitions of, of the, 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 the logic of a perceptor, the logic of a motivator, these are all definitions. They are all immutable entities. They hold data the focus of a perceptor, for example, and functions. How do you analyze a percept to generate a new percept? So th these are really um, immutable entities. Now, we said that uh, they can, um, smart things can form a community. The rovers can actually form a community. And, and as you've seen, if one gets scared, it will, it will be communicated to the other ones, and they'll go into a group panic. So they can, they can sense each other. So uh, when uh, smart things are part of a community, they immediately establish a peer to peer network and um, they can broadcast to all the network uh, their state of mind, basically. And that turns into a percept that can lead to motives and behaviors. So, just very simple, so it's a bit of a complex, but you just look onto the right. Whenever one, whenever one, ro uh, one rover says, you know, I'm scared. This will be heard as a percept by another one, and 
if that one is not already panicking, it will start, a, you know, it will, it will say, oh, someone else is panicking, and, and that will turn on the fear motive. Simple stuff. The brood is monitored by the parents' community. In, in, in our, my demo here, there's only one uh, parent. And they, the communities talk to each other through uh, uh, rest endpoints, and for, as far as the implementation is concerned. And when mom says to the puppy, calm down, that becomes a percept that then leads to uh, behavior, basically calming down, turning off of the fear motive, basically which is what this code does. And again, it's a quite a direct mapping between the ubiquitous language of the mom to the uh, implementation of the perceptors of the mom. When mom perceives out-of-control panicking, she will fire up, uh, uh, she, will, she will, when she hears someone panic, more than one panicking, they say, ah, this is out-of-control panicking. That's how she detects it. And her behavior that gets triggered by that uh, is to tell the brood to calm down. Very simple. And to say, tell the brood to calm down is to first voice, so we can hear, you know, calm down little Marv, calm down little Rodney, and then uh, send a command through that, H to that REST API, and that is received by the puppy, is perceived, I just perceive the command to calm down from mom, so I'm gonna turn off my fear motive. And now I can be curious again and roam about and find out about this wonderful world. So, a few parting words. It is my absolute belief that DDD is as vital today as when it was first articulated. And it's definitely not restricted to business application, proof positive. And also, I, I would like to... Um, I've given you just a taste of what it feels like to do... Um, uh, to implement uh, uh, bounded context and ubiquitous languages in, in Elixir, in an actor model with functional programming, I've given you a taste. Let me tell you, it's absolute pure joy. The, the mapping is quite direct. You, you feel that you're expressing in code the concepts that you've come up with. And because it's the Erlang runtime environment, I never was concerned about having too many processes about hugging down the system because one process would take up all the resources and leave none for others. I was free. I just freely created this society of mine, expecting it to work, and guess what? It did. So I encourage you very much to look at uh, concurrent oriented pro uh, programming, Elixir, and the actor model, and, and with your DDD hat on. Thank you very much, and I'll take questions. Any questions? I believe we're going to try and get a microphone run around. OK. Did you imagine to uh, try to implement a calibration of a robot to learn more and mm -hmm. to gain skills? Ah, uh, yes. Well, <laughs> yes. But that's, 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 that's a hard one. It's a hard one because since so much is happening at the same time, you cannot, looking at the outcome of your behavior directly infer a decision you made in terms of turning on a motive on or off or taking this path versus this other in a finite machine as the decision that led you in a, in a bad spot. So that's a difficult one. But maybe I can, I can uh, accumulate statistical information that says, for example, getting unstuck. If I my, uh, my, uh, my uh, heuristic is turn around and then try again, well, I'll be facing the wall the same way, right? So maybe I, I can learn how many degrees I turned and, 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 and correlate that to whether I was stuck again and maybe favor certain random behaviors, making them less random because in, in certain, certain configurations, it, sen it seems to work better. So that's, I've been thinking about that. And the other form of, of, of learning is uh, some of the, the, the detectors 
instead of being just like pure reading from, from a sensor, could uh, be a more complex detectors that have some machine learning uh, in them so that they, they, they perceive, for example, um, higher level perceptors could actually benefit from machine learning in order to make, uh, to analyze percepts coming in and based on a neural network, decide, ah, oh, this is what it means and not something else. So that's the two kinds of learning I've been thinking about. Yes. Eric. Well, uh, you, you did briefly mention fainting and yes. then said, I'm not going to talk about that, but maybe you could just briefly explain. Yes. Actually, uh, um, what happens is that if, if, you, if you activate all the detectors all the time, you flood your system with, with percepts, and all the perceptors that respond to these percepts just add to the flood. And, and, and once in a while, what happens is that by the time an intent find its way to an actuator, that intent was based on perceptions that were like four seconds old, and the intent was three seconds old, and the robot was reacting to something that was true four seconds. It was avoiding an obstacle that wasn't there anymore, for example. And, and so I realized that if, if, if the, the robot starts reacting to a, 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 the world as it was too long ago, I need to shut down the percepts, cut the, the, the fire hose, basically, turn off the, the, the water, let everything wash through the system, in essence, faint. So I would, I would make my robot faint for about two or three seconds, then it would awaken again, and, and all the old percepts would have flushed through the system. Now, that's one of the reasons why I implemented attention in order to minimize the need for fainting. But I still need to faint. Yeah. So when you decide to faint? I decide to faint when everything um, is getting too old, when the intents are getting too old. Like, uh, actuator receives an intent says, whoa, this intent was generated three seconds ago. Time to faint. And then, then, then a, a signal is sent to the central nervous system and just... Um, so, uh, yeah. but yes. we're out of time. All right. Well, I'll, I will talk that. I'll be in the blue, uh, the blue space, so we can continue this conversation. These, these are all fascinating uh, ideas. So, okay. one more round. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>